Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <coughs> it's a real privilege for me to welcome all of you, to, all of you here this afternoon on what is a rainy day. Thank you all for trudging across uh, the rain and traffic jams that are inevitable in this city now. Uh, for what promises to be a, a truly insightful, important, and exciting conversation. Uh, I have known Professor Bose uh, in his many avatars, uh, and uh, he, he has been a very important uh, uh, voice uh, of reason in, in, in our lives, and, and a voice of and someone whom we've learned from a lot. But uh, it has been an absolute breath of fresh air that he chose to make the jump from uh, the ivory towers of academia into the hurly burly of politics, particularly now. Because what we've seen in the last few years in Parliament uh, has been truly, truly depressing, except on the few occasions where Professor Bose makes an intervention. And that reminds you of what the institution is actually meant to be and what truly parliamentary democracy is meant to bring to our nation. So um, thank you so much for what you have done. That reminder in these times is truly important for this nation. Um, and. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to have the privilege of uh, engaging with you in, in, in the dialogues that you have started in Parliament, particularly on issues of nationalism, national identity that have been so critical to what is happening in our political uh, space in India over the last few years here at CPR. Thank you for being here. It's a real honor. And thank you, Namita, for organizing this talk. Over to both of you uh, to, to, uh, to begin this conversation. Thank you, Yamini. Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, uh, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to everyone in this room and to our audience uh, on Facebook Live. Thank you for your overwhelming response to and attendance at this event. It is a very great pleasure and a real honour for me to welcome current Member of Parliament from the Trinamool Congress in West Bengal and my former Professor, Sugata Bose, who has uh, very kindly agreed to take time off from the monsoon session of Parliament to come and interact with us on, um, as Yamini said, some of the pressing issues facing our nation today. Professor Bose is currently the Gardner Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard University. He has previously served as Director of Graduate Studies in History at Harvard, as well as the Founding Director of Harvard's South Asia Institute. Uh, Professor Bose was educated at Prince Residency College, Calcutta, and holds a doctorate from the University of Cambridge. His prolific scholarship uh, has contributed to a deeper understanding of colonial and post-colonial political economy in India, as well as Indian ethical discourses, political philosophy, and economic thought. He is currently representing Jadavpur University, uh, Jadavpur constituency, uh, in Parliament. <coughs> And in Parliament, he's also a member of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on External Affairs. So, when, uh, when we discussed the idea of having this conversation, uh, Professor Bose uh, uh, really wanted this to be structured as, as an interaction with uh, everyone. But to start off uh, this uh, conversation, there are many, many pressing issues uh, that Parliament is confronting today. But um, I, do, I, I do want to start off by talking about his latest book published by Penguin last year called The Nation as Mother and Other Visions of Nationhood, which is essentially a collection of essays that were written in 1997, at the time of India's 50th anniversary of independence, as well as his speeches in Parliament over the last four years, where he has spoken about diverse issues, including the need to reform education in India, to cultivate what he calls cultural intimacy as opposed to intolerance, measures for achieving peace in Kashmir, and, and also along the India-Bangladesh border, including more recently in his interview in the Indian Express and other, and other fora, the burning issue of the National Register for Citizens in Assam, as well as more prosaic subjects like fiscal federalism. But what I felt after reading the book and sort of engaging with the, with the speeches as well as the essays uh, was that uniting your perspective on these diverse issues is a particular understanding on nationalism. And which is why, you know, the conversation today, we're structuring around this theme, because uh, this is something which sort of feeds into our understanding of the debates on these issues across uh, the political spectrum. And this particular understanding of nationalism, which, um, you know, 
you sort of do two things. You are you're talking about a certain understanding of nationalism derived from the writings of people like Rabindranath Tagore, Vipin Chandra Pal, as well as the practice of Gandhi Ji and Subhash Chandra Bose, um, which is the idea of the the nation as mother, and that's also the sort of the title of the book. And with with that idea, you talk about the partition of India as essentially matricide, and uh, you say that you know. Uh, and, and there's this fascinating little bit of legend that you describe in the book where Parshuram, uh, who is the sixth avatar of Vishnu, uh, murders his mother on the command of his father. And how, like these uh, scholars, understand the partition of India as essentially uh, the sort of matricide that Parshuram uh, commits. But you also talk about how this narrative of nation as mother encapsulated within it political differences based on class, religious affiliation, linguistic identity, and then. You talk about the concept of the nation state, which you know you say is what actually the Indian state embraced post post uh, colonization, post independence, and you say, and I quote from uh, the essay that this concept of a nation state relied on a concept of sovereignty borrowed from modern Europe that denied the multiple identities and several layered sovereignties that have been the complex legacy of India from its pre-colonial past. And once again, throughout your speeches in Parliament, you have stressed on more than one occasion that unity is not uniformity, and democracy is not majoritarianism. So, in effect, you know, like in the essays, you lay the blame of partition equally at the hands of the Congress and the Hindu Mahasabha, as well as uh, you know the Muslim League, who you say raised well in the context of the you know the Congress and the Hindu Mahasabha, you say raised a sharpened parshu to slice Mother India into two. Would you say that the conditions of the current situation in India, where we have an identification of the current government with the nation, so that criticisms of the government are branded as anti-national and the law of sedition is used to stifle dissent, um, are these? Is this situation a creation and perhaps a culmination of decades of anti-federal, what you call anti-federal Congress rule, or are we seeing something different, more sinister than we have seen before? So that's my first question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, Yamini, for your generous uh, welcome, and uh, Nomita for uh, set setting the stage uh, for uh, for this conversation. Uh, may I, uh, at the outset, uh, pay a tribute to uh, uh, Kalaina Dr. M. Karunanidhi, who passed away uh, yesterday and whose funeral is uh, taking place today. Uh, I do so because uh, you know he was a great uh, champion of uh, federalism. Uh, the Indian National Congress uh, inherited uh, the unitary centre of the British Raj in 1947, and uh, even though we adopted a constitution that was federal in form, our state structure uh, remained uh, unitary in many respects. Even Dr. Ambedkar acknowledged that he did not really have time uh, to, um, uh, to revise so many of the clauses in our constitution which were taken lock, stock and barrel from the Government of India Act of 1935. And that piece of legislation uh, was uh, designed by the British to retain real power in their own hands at the centre while giving something to Indians at the local and, and provincial levels. Now, it is our democratic political processes uh, which uh, enabled uh, regional aspirations to be articulated. Most of the regional parties that we see active today emerged in the 1980s and 1990s, but uh, the DK and the DMK you know, preceded this uh, phenomenon. And after all, uh, the Dravida Munnetra Kazagam led by Anna Durai uh, came to power in 1967, and Karunanidhi he served as chief minister from 1969 onwards. So, in many ways, the DMK and Annadurai and Karunanidhi were pioneers in the process of uh, the regionalization of our politics. Now, one of the major themes of this book uh, that Nomita has mentioned, uh, the nation as mother and other visions of uh, nationhood, uh, you know, it uh, it is a book that includes uh, 10 academic essays uh, written between the 1990s and the 2010s. I do have an essay on Gandhi uh, 
and partition, which was initially given as a uh, B.R. Nanda Memorial Lecture in December 2014. Um, and then, of course, there are six of my, uh, you know, parliamentary speeches. But one of the, you know, main purposes of, of this book was to re-excavate the best in anti-colonial political thought uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And what I suggest is that most of our political leaders and thinkers offered variations uh, on the federal idea. They were all arguing in one way or another uh, that Indian unity can truly only be federal in nature. Uh, so even when you think about the um, name for our country, uh, Bharat, India, that is Bharat, you know, Bipin Chandra Pal had asked in his book, The Soul of India, who is this Bharat? Uh, he's just a legendary king at the center of a circle of kings. He's not to be seen as, a, as an emperor ruling over a centralized uh, polity. And what I have suggested in so many of my uh, articles and uh, parliamentary speeches is that, um, you know, we don't live in the age of monarchy anymore, even though there is a lot of dynastic politics around. Uh, so in a democracy, uh, we really have to think of the central government as a government at the center of many state governments. Uh, and what I have suggested is that the overwhelming trend in our political thought, even up to about 1930 and even further, was to think of India as a federal union. And the end result in 1947, where we inherited, you know, the British Raj's unitary center, was in many ways out of sync uh, with the best traditions in our political thought. Both pre-colonial political thought, where I've talked about in theory and in practice, Indian unity only worked when we had a conception of layered and shared sovereignty. The sovereign at the center was only the highest manifestation of sovereignty. You had to acknowledge sovereignty at other layers of the polity. But also in modern times, uh, you know, it was the federal idea, as even Bipin Chandra Pal put it, uh, you know, during the age of Muslim sovereigns, Indian unity, always more or less of a federal type, became even more pronouncedly so. Now, uh, if you look at global history, all the way from the 1860s to about the 1960s, you see an age of territoriality, as my colleague uh, Charles Meyer has argued in so much of his work. Even in India, it was after 1857 that the British Raj introduced notions of unitary sovereignty and a centralized state, at least in those parts of India where there were British Indian provinces, not necessarily the, uh, the, the princely states. Um, and the heyday of the modern centralized unitary nation state in Asia, and also I might add Africa, lasted for all of about four decades from the late 40s and to the late 1980s. So many of the very creative ideas about India's federal polity that lost out in 1947 have become more salient, in my view, in the early 21st century. And I'm convinced that it's only a free and flexible federal union that will be a stronger and longer lasting union. I just want to add a word about the nation as mother idea, which is uh, a part of, uh, which has been mentioned, which is my title, but the and other visions of nationhood, uh, that bit is equally important in reflecting the contents of this, of this book. If you see this image, you know, of uh, Bharat Mata, first of all, we have to recognize that Abhinindranath initially titled it Bongo Mata. Mother Bengal in 1905. And then Sister Nevedita persuaded him to make a gift of it to the cause of the Indian nation as a whole. So it got to be retitled Bharat Mata. And in those days, you know, it was interchangeable. There was no necessary conflict between, you know, regional identity and an overarching national identity. Think of the poetry of Subramanya Bharati. You know, it could be interchangeably about the, 
you know, the Tamil mother country and about the, uh, about the Indian nation as a whole. But even beyond that, uh, what you see is that this kind of an image is meant to evoke feelings of devotion. Uh, it's not, you know, meant to uh, you know, somehow provoke feelings of hatred for any kind of other, uh, even though there is, you know, a kind of spiritual ethos, uh, you know, in this particular uh, image. And that is what I want to emphasize, that these days, you know, if you don't shout Bharat Mata Ki Jai, you might be beaten up. I mean, that is not the kind of patriotism that was reflected uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of image. And yes, uh, in response to the question that uh, Nomita posed at the end of uh, her introduction, it is true that there were ideologies of state, including secularism and socialism, that sought to buttress our centralized post-colonial state from 1947 to the 1980s. Um, and there were many assaults on uh, the federal idea, even in these early decades. But now the situation is much worse and much more dangerous. Uh, it's only when, you know, secularism and socialism began to fail uh, that, you know, our centralized state uh, began to put on the saffron garb. And religious majoritarianism has now become the ideology to buttress uh, an over-centralized state, despite all kinds of lip service that gets to be paid to the idea of cooperative federalism. So at this point, we are at uh, a critical moment at a crossroads where you have a vision of a new India being propagated by our prime minister, which I think fundamentally is based on the untrammeled dominance of one religious community defined as a majority since British colonial days and of really one language as well. And to that, we need to counterpose an alternative vision of a new India, which respects genuine and substantive federalism, but is also uh, based on a, on a quest for greater cultural intimacy as I've put it in many of my speeches, borrowing the phrase from Shubhash Chandra Bose, uh, that cultural intimacy among India's different religious communities. Thank you. So that actually leads on to my next question, which is deriving from your understanding of nationalism, are your ideas of secularism and cultural intimacy? Here again, you critique the Congress policy on secularism as statism. Could you elaborate on that? So that's the first part of the question. And then you go on to describe the wave of intolerance in India as a violation of the principles of what Dr. Ambedkar called constitutional morality. And you emphasize that we have to go beyond tolerance, that mere tolerance is not enough. What we need is cultural intimacy. So my questions to you are threefold. First is to elaborate on the issue of Congress secularism as statism. The second is how do we foster cultural intimacy as a value, not just through speeches, but through concrete policy, legal and administrative frameworks, because the kinds of examples you give of the INA and, you know, others as instances of cultural, genuine cultural intimacy fall within the domain of civil society in a way, you know, the, the sort of eating together and, and, and you know, some of those examples that you bring out from the INA, the three men who were sentenced to deportation from India for life, but only to be saved by the political uprising that happened around the Quit India movement and so on. I mean, how do we actually ensure cultural intimacy within the, the, uh, you know, the domain of civil society, the private space and so on? Can we do that through, uh, you know, policy, legal, administrative frameworks? And if not, then how do we do it? And related to that is the question of, uh, you know, secularism. What is the, what is, so if the if the Congress version of secularism and statism is uh, obviously failed and is uh, not the right way, there are, I mean, different countries have understood secularism differently. So we have the France version, we have the US version. What is your version of secularism as India should espouse it? I mean, it is definitely a value which is there in our, uh, in our preamble. It has been held to be part of the basic structure. So, but what, but, but these are abstract ideas and how do we concretize them in a way that actually, um, that actually fosters cultural <laughs> intimacy as well as uh, genuine democracy. 
you know, I would straight away uh, make a <laughs> distinction between secularism as a system of values, uh, which I support and endorse, uh, and um, secularism as an ideology of state, particularly the ideology of a uh, over of an over centralized post colonial state. Um, so, uh, I think it's important to recognize that the term secular or secularism was not in wide currency all the way up to 1947. It was occasionally used, um, but um, it emerged as a word and a concept uh, that was used by many of our leaders only from about 1950 onwards. And, uh, and unfortunately, secularism got reduced to being a slogan, uh, particularly as the decades drew on. And by the 1980s, there was a great deal of skepticism about both the legitimizing ideologies of state. Uh, secularism and, uh, and and socialism. Uh, you're right that uh, I have argued in all the debates that have uh, taken place about supposed growing intolerance in our country that, um, you know, tolerance is not enough. Uh, and, you know, there I think we can go back to many of our great thinkers who uh, thought in the same way. Even if you think about Swami Vivekananda's famous uh, 1893 speech, uh, he's, he's basically saying that he's not making an argument for toleration. He's actually claiming the equal truth <coughs> of all religions, which goes far beyond just tolerating another religious faith or members of uh, another uh, religious community. And that's why I felt that we have to have a higher aspiration. Are we just going to tolerate each other? Or is our idea of uh, India uh, going to be infused with a, you know, much higher, you know, ethical meaning? Uh, so that is exactly what uh, I, I was saying. And of course, um, you know, intolerance is just a euphemism for what I think is a wave of uh, unreason, injustice, inhumanity that is sweeping across our country. And in the speech that I gave, uh, I think it was on the 1st of December of 2015, and this was after the terrible uh, uh, killing of Muhammad Aklak, not so far from Delhi. I was just driving towards Noida the other day and I saw Dadri. And Dadri, the place has come to be associated with this terrible uh, incident. And I tried to explain to my fellow parliamentarians uh, the meaning of the word or the name Aklak. Uh, it actually means ethics. And if you look at the history of our political philosophy, there is an abundance of Aklak literature. It's about uh, the ethics of government. It is about legitimacy. What is good governance? And it seemed to me, you know, the death of Aklak almost symbolized uh, the death of the ethics of uh, good governance uh, in our country. Now, Namita, you're asking me a difficult question that, um, you know, the, uh, the cultural intimacy that I'm calling for, uh, you know, probably can take place through social movements, uh, or through the mobilization of civil society. But how do you translate it into, you know, state policy? Uh, how can, you know, governments sort of promote it? And I'll come to that. But, but I want to, first of all, suggest this, that many of our, you know, major leaders and thinkers of the pre-independence era all knew how to respect cultural difference, including religious difference. And this you see in Mahatma Gandhi, in Rabindranath Tagore, uh, and of course you also see it in uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose. Uh, 
but there are subtle differences. Tagore is very clear. Uh, we think of him as a poet, but his essays need to be read today, particularly the essays in Bharat Varsha, of which one chapter is called Bharat Varsha Itihash, the history of India. And he says very clearly that where there is genuine difference, he uses the Bengali term Parthakko. Uh, where there is genuine difference, it's only by uh, recognizing and respecting that difference and then restraining it in its proper place that you can achieve unity. You will never achieve unity by issuing legal fiats that everybody is one. Now, in some ways, Nehruvian secularism made that mistake. It tried to issue legal fiats that everybody is one, and that may not be the best way to achieve unity. You know, secular uniformity or religious majoritarian uniformity are both very different from genuine unity. Now, Mahatma Gandhi respected difference, but there was a problem there. You know, even in the early 1920s, when he forged Hindu-Muslim unity in his non-cooperation movement, and through his support for the, for the Khilafat, he would not sit down to dine together with his closest political comrades, Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali. He was quite witty about it. He said that, um, look, um, you know, this is my self-denial. Uh, it's, you know, you might call it bigotry. And uh, he likened eating to the other privately performed sanitary practices of life. Um, but he too changed over a period of time. And that's where uh, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose was different from both Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, he was different from Mahatma Gandhi in arguing for cultural intimacy, uh, taking a stand against exclusivity among religious communities. And he did this from the 1920s onwards. He was also different from Nehru because he was, being from Bengal, I think, uh, he understood that we had to you know, respect differences ex expressed in both the linguistic idiom and religious idiom, but you could transcend those differences to forge a broader overarching Indian unity. But he actually put cultural intimacy into practice. Uh, when 75 years ago, he became Supreme Commander of the Indian National Army, the Azad Hind Forge, and he made sure that there were common messes, which there weren't in the British Indian Army that Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians would actually dine together before they went to fight together in Imphal and uh, uh, Kohima. Uh, and he made sure that he rejected the British uh, uh, anthropological theory of martial races and martial castes. Of course, the professional soldiers were mostly Punjabis, Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs, Pathans. But he made sure that the South Indians who were mostly uh, settled in Southeast Asia, the Tamils in particular were recruited into his, uh, his Azad Hind uh, forge. And it's fascinating to find that Mahatma Gandhi ultimately accepted this notion of cultural intimacy. When he went to visit uh, the INA prisoners, both in the Red Fort and in the Kabul lines, uh, the INA soldiers told him that, look, we recognized no differences when we fought for India's freedom uh, in Southeast Asia. But here, our British captors are trying to serve us Hindu tea and Muslim tea. And Gandhi asked, why do you suffer it? And they said, we don't. We mix uh, Hindu and Muslim tea half and half and then serve. And so Mahatma Gandhi laughed and he said this was a very good idea. And he had changed his views by 1945-46 on both interdining and also intermarriage. He was very clear, and I've written about it in my Gandhi chapter in this book. He was asked this question in Noah Kali, and he was forthright, that there was a time when I had been opposed to it, but now I have changed my mind. So, uh, so I think that, you know, even a Mahatma Gandhi uh, was moving, uh, you know, in this, uh, you know, particular direction. And he was fascinating in the mid-1940s, he would say, that I'm a Sanatani Hindu and therefore I'm at the same time a Muslim and a Christian. I'm a Gujarati, therefore I'm an Indian and by extension, therefore I'm a Bengali. You know, and, and that has become the ethical imperative for us in India today, to be really respectful of our multiple identities and only on that basis can, uh, can we build you know, genuine 
uh, Indian unity. Yeah, but I'd like to press you a little bit on this though. I mean, common messes in the army sounds to me very much like a legal fiat. So, if you, uh, how would you distinguish Subhash Chandra Bose's approach from Nehru's approach? You know, he never asked uh, Hindus or, or, or Muslims or uh, Sikhs or Christians uh, to, to give up their, their identities, including their religious identities or their linguistic identities. You know, a Tamil could still be a Tamil and have a higher loyalty to the, to the cause of India. And he actually, in order to forge cultural intimacy, made sure that, you know, Muslims would entertain you know, Hindus, Sikhs and Christians, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the occasion of Eid and vice versa um, in the case of Hindu festivals. He, he said that we don't know enough of about each other's religious beliefs, uh, practices and so forth. So there has to be, you know, uh, that, you know, so he was not actually imposing uniformity. He was respecting diversity and then s saying that you can rise, uh, you know, above it all. And, and forge unity. But you had asked a very interesting question about, you know, what legal forms can, you know, this take? And, uh, and of course, I have mentioned uh, Ambedkar's conception, but it wasn't Ambedkar's alone. There were a whole range of others in the Constituent Assembly uh, who talked about the importance of constitutional morality and that not only citizens, but even governments have to be taught uh, the concept uh, and the ethic of, of constitutional morality. Uh, I'll give you a, a, an example which is very pressing at the moment to say why we should actually enact certain kinds of laws. Uh, and this is in the you know, context of lynching. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court has said that we should have a separate uh, central uh, law on lynching. And I agree with that because I think that lynching needs to be defined as a hate crime and as a crime against the constitution, which is why I think a new law is needed. Now, we know that in the United States of America, there were numerous attempts from 1918 onwards to pass an anti-lynching federal law, and all of them failed. Uh, and as a result, what, what do we have? In 2005, the Senate, which had blocked, uh, you know, a law of that kind, there were uh, Democratic senators from the southern states who used to block these efforts. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, in 2005, the Senate had to apologize for these historic injustices, the crimes that had been committed from 1882 until uh, the uh, uh, 1940s, nearly 5,000 people had been lynched in America. More than 75% happened to be African Americans. Just as in our country, you know, if you look at the lynchings, I mean, there's always this uh, attempt to, uh, you know, conflate road rage with uh, lynching by cow vigilantes. And we are now beginning to find that what got to be passed off as road rage in Hapur was actually a uh, crime committed by uh, cow, cow vigilantes. So even in our country, I mean, all the statistics show that there may be lynching of different kinds, but, you know, certainly more than three quarters of the victims of lynchings have been, have been Muslims. We have to face up to that fact. It is the minorities which fa face the brunt of this kind of lynching. In 2018, three U.S. senators led by Kamala Harris, who has both you know, African-American and South Asian uh, ancestry, they have brought a law just uh, at the end of June. But that is going to be just a symbolic law because uh, fortunately it would appear, I don't know what will ha happen if Trump continues in power for much longer, but the age of lynching in America has ended. So it's going to be a symbolic law, even if it gets to be enacted. So are we going to be like the Americans and have to apologize decades later for the terrible crimes that are taking place today? Or are we going to act now? And with the Supreme Court having given a particular direction, are we going to enact a central law 
uh, against, uh, you know, this kind of horror uh, and, and make sure that it is a law that is uh, effectively uh, implemented. So there are things that we can do. We have to recognize lynching as a hate crime and as a crime against the Constitution. Of course, given the numbers in our parliament today, I'm not sure that we will succeed unless it changes quite dramatically at the next general elections. Speaking of the US, um, uh, you know, the US has just constituted something called the Religious Liberty Task Force, which the Attorney General has just put out, which is essentially, um, you know, uh, to protect people's uh, ability to practice their faith, but it's obviously being uh, criticized as an attempt for uh, ensuring that conservative Christian values can actually be protected against critique. So, uh, because I do think that this, you know, this debate has been such a central debate, not just in India, like what is, re what version of state secularism should we have? Yeah. Um, would, would that, minus its sort of sinister wrappings, would that be something uh, of an intervention? Because lynching is about toleration. I mean, the fact that you're killing people, we're not even beginning, like on a spectrum of toleration to cultural intimacy, we're not even there when we're lynching people. So, uh, so how do we foster, uh, you know, these uh, these values? I mean, the, I mean, I, I get the difference between Nehru's uh, mm -hmm. view, which is about more about uniformity within unity, as compared to what you were saying was the approach of Subhash Chandra Bose, which is that no, we 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 have all these different communities, but we all need to get to know each other and and so on, which is very different, of course. But how? Uh, as, as a state, how do we do that? You know, so it, there are certain basic differences. I mean, France is very sort of on one end of the spectrum, doesn't want any kind of religious, uh, uh, you know, activity in, in, in political and state space. Um, India, we have uh, we, we have holidays for most of the religions that we have and, and things like that. So there is definitely that kind of recognition of diversity at, at the level of the state as well. Uh, but like you said, that the people are operating more in silos, there's more ghettoization also, uh, you know, in, would some would things like housing anti-discrimination laws mm -hmm. and things like that, would they foster this idea of cultural intimacy? Because right now we have, uh, we don't have, uh, you know, even though the constitution actually applies the provisions of untouchability and so on to private action as well, like it's not discrimination by private citizens can also be unconstitutional with that realm. We don't actually have statutes yet uh, to prevent discrimination in the in the in the private space. So would that help foster cultural intimacy? Because right now we have Hindu societies denying rental uh, spaces to Muslims, uh, to to people and usually it is uh, it is sort of uh, based on vegetarianism. <coughs> you know that's how sort of innocuously it comes in but essentially it is to debut. So would laws like that help foster uh, the cultural intimacy that you're talking about? Yes. Uh, first, since you mentioned uh, the United States, uh, I'd like to say that, um, you know, Barack Obama uh, had a very nuanced perspective uh, on this matter. He went out of his way to suggest uh, that we must be respectful of religious faith. And that's something that we also need to understand here. Because, you know, the majority of people in our country uh, are God-fearing. Um, they are religious in one way or another, but I also believe that the majority of our people uh, don't harbor religious prejudice. Uh, they are not bigoted against members of uh, other religious communities or towards other religious faiths. The problem with Jawaharlal Nehru, as I see it, if you read his autobiography, you will find that there is a chapter which is titled Communalism Rampant. Now, he's writing about the period 1926-1927, uh, when particularly in Punjab, but elsewhere as well, uh, you know, there was suddenly a kind of a recrudescence of uh, riots in urban centers and so forth. And in that chapter, he blames religion. You know, the, he says religion and the spirit of religion have caused this. What killjoys they have been. And even in this book, I've suggested that was a misdiagnosis of the problem. I mean, there was nothing wrong with religion as such. So we need to make a distinction between religious faith and religious sensibility on the one hand and religious 
bigotry and prejudice on the other. Uh, and uh, if we do that, then we will not end up making religion the enemy of, of the nation. I think that was, you know, I am somebody who belongs to a generation bred in the Nehruvian secular tradition. That's the kind of schooling I had. That's the kind of education I had. But already from the 1990s, I could see that we had to, you know, rethink uh, secularism. And we had to make precisely the distinction that I was talking about. Uh, on, on a more practical matter, yes, I do believe that there can be legal interventions that can be made, particularly if we want to forge cultural intimacy. We really need to take a stand against the ghettoization, as you put it, that is taking place in terms of separate neighborhoods in many of our uh, cities and towns. You know, Ahmedabad seems to be almost completely segregated uh, today. But even in cities like Delhi or Mumbai, even Kolkata, we constantly hear anecdotal evidence which is compelling enough that, uh, you know, uh, even members of our elites who happen to have uh, Muslim names are, you know, deprived of uh, housing in certain areas. And therefore, you know, powerful laws uh, against housing discrimination of the sort that we do have in other countries, you know, powerful laws against discrimination in giving bank credit or loans when it comes to housing and so forth, I think can be used as policy interventions uh, in our quest for greater cultural intimacy. So, moving on from constitutional and spiritual values of secularism and nationalism to more prosaic uh, aspects of fiscal federalism and, uh, you know, uh, in your speech on fiscal federalism, you lamented, as many of us here at CPR do all the time, that our government's focus on physical infrastructure far outweighs its focus on social infrastructure like health and education. And um, in your book, you include also a review of Ramachandra Guha's book, India After Gandhi, where disagreeing with his eulogization of Nehru, you rightly castigate Nehru's neglect of education. Um, so basically, do you think the ruling party's focus on physical infrastructure, which you have criticized in, in your speeches, is continuing again the problematic approach we've had over decades of prioritizing physical infrastructure over social infrastructure issues? Um, are things getting better or worse? Is the Geo Institute of Eminence controversy just so much hoopla about, you know, mm -hmm. something to, uh, but but really the, the policy throughout the years has been more, more or less the same, the neglect of primary education, the neglect of healthcare, the fact that we cannot... The, the fact that we are not spending enough on healthcare that we haven't, uh, you know, we, we made a commitment to double our spending on healthcare. Uh, we haven't done that. We spend like one point, uh, only like 1.5% of our uh, budget on health. Similarly situated countries like Brazil are spending 5 to 6% on both health and education. So is this, you know, if, again, are things more or less the same or are things getting worse or are things getting better? Uh, I'm all in favor of uh, improving our physical infrastructure. Uh, I do think we need to spend on, uh, you know, building roads and uh, uh, improving our railways, uh, uh, building airports and so forth. Uh, so, uh, I, 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 I don't object to that at all. In fact, we should do quite a lot of it, but we should not be neglecting, uh, you know, social infrastructure, particularly uh, health and education. Now, there is a lot of rhetoric uh, about, uh, you know, the government's commitment to uh, health care, including primary health care. Uh, there was an announcement at the last budget that there would be a grand uh, insurance scheme uh, for large numbers of our poor. But it is not backed up uh, with the provision of, uh, <laughs> of resources. So, you know, if, if that is the case, then I think the opposition... Uh, can uh, legitimately say that this is not much more than an election uh, gimmick. Now, on the question of neglect of uh, both primary education and primary health care, uh, yes, I have been critical of what was not done in the early decades after independence. Historically, that has been our greatest failure. 
not to have focused on primary education and primary health care. Now, in the 21st century, to some degree, uh, things have improved, uh, at least so far as access to primary education is concerned. I think we've done more in the last 18 years uh, than uh, we managed to do in the 53 years since uh, independence uh, in the in the 20th century, but the quality of uh, education uh, at the primary level and also the secondary school level remains a huge concern. Uh, so I would say that at least on the primary education front, you know, the trend is that we are doing somewhat better than what we did in the early decades after independence. But if we consider higher education, you know, at least we had some achievements, you know, you might say it was elitism, but there were certain concrete achievements in the Nehruvian era and also, you know, during the period that uh, Indira Gandhi was, uh, was prime minister. And I fear that uh, so far as higher education is concerned, uh, we may be going backward. Uh, I'm, you know, in those days, there weren't any global rankings of repute. But I think that in the early 20th century, even in the early decades after independence, some of our institutions might have ranked quite high, but we don't now. And I think that uh, both the Higher Education Commission of India bill is, uh, you know, of course, is ill thought out. And this exercise of creating institutions of eminence, where six institutions have been chosen so far, uh, has been, its credibility has been completely undermined uh, as a result of the selection of the non-existent GEO Institute as one of the institutions of of, of eminence. I raised this matter in Parliament in in this monsoon uh, session. Uh, When I asked a question about the Higher Education Commission, I did get an assurance on the floor of the House that uh, it is uh, being completely revised and redrafted and that academicians, I was told, uh, would have a majority and not bureaucrats uh, in the revised draft. Uh, But we have to see what kind of academicians get to be uh, appointed. And so far as the institutions of eminence is concerned, I, I must say that I was the first to raise it Uh, You will see, even in that speech on fiscal federalism, I suggested that uh, we, of course, have to ensure broad access to higher education. But so far as excellence is concerned, I suggested that it may be uh, legitimate uh, to choose 10 existing, promising uh, public universities to be given extra support. Uh, but I had not mentioned private institutions at all. Uh, But now what I find is that there are three public institutions that have been selected, two IITs, one IISC, and there are three private institutions of of which one is this famous uh, non-existent uh, uh, GEO uh, Institute. You will notice that there is not one university that has been included uh, so far. Uh, And uh, I asked the HRD minister, are you then saying that there is not a single central or state university in our country that has the potential to become a world-class institution, even while you are recognizing the potential of a completely non-existent private uh, institution? And I really think that universities uh, should be uh, included. There is nothing wrong intrinsically in giving some extra support to promising uh, uh, universities. China started in in, in 1993. They went a step further in 1998, the centenary of Peking University. But at that stage, of the 37 universities that they chose, the leading ones were Peking University, Fudan University, and Tsinghua University, all of which are now top-ranked universities. They went for universal universities, not just institutes of... uh, you know, uh, technology. And now they have their double first class initiative, which they announced in 2017. They are giving special support to 42 universities. But of course, again, Peking University is leading the way. But we are 
you know, in a situation where our government is demoralizing our public universities and starving them of resources. And this does not bode well for higher education in our country. Thank you. Um, and finally, before I open it up, uh, it would be great if you could share with us how difference is mediated through parliament. For the larger public, we see the parliamentary disruptions and we see the speeches, all of which are part of attempts to hold the government to account uh, for their actions to question them, but also a form of unhealthy political posturing at times. Um, but in the parliamentary standing and steering committees, when they do function, important compromises are negotiated on important issues across uh, a very divisive political spectrum. You yourself have been part of the External Affairs Committee in this parliament. Could you share with us how parliament negotiates difference? And perhaps that can be an example for how we think about negotiating difference in the larger polity. And, and related to that, also share some of your reflections on parliament as an institution. My own sense working on the tribal question for the last five years um, is that because of the 10th schedule, which prohibits not just defection of, from a political party, but also defying the party whip is prohibited in parliament. This is the sense that I've gotten uh, by speaking to tribal MPs. We have 50 reserved tribal constituencies, which means we have 50 tribal MPs in parliament, which is more than the strength currently of the Congress in the Lok Sabha, which only has 46 MPs. And yet what they say is that they are unable to raise uh, issues on behalf of the tribal community as a bloc because they have to go along their party line. Uh, how can we improve parliamentary functioning such that parliament is not just a majoritarian body, but truly democratic? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I don't like uh, the amendment that was passed when uh, Rajiv Gandhi had a brute majority uh, in the 1980s. Uh, you know, there are other countries where uh, political parties give a whip uh, to members of parliament. Uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, which is the parliamentary democracy on which we fashioned our system, political parties give whips. But if uh, a member decides, uh, based on his her, her conscience, to go against the whip, that MP will not lose uh, his or her seat in, in Parliament. But if there is a three-line whip in our Parliament, uh, then, you know, whatever might be your personal views, however strongly held they might be, uh, if you defy that party whip, you will actually uh, lose your uh, seat in Parliament. And I think that this is unhealthy for our parliamentary uh, uh, democracy. In most instances, members of parliament will go along with their party line, but sometimes there are vital issues that come up uh, where one should be free uh, to vote according to one's, uh, one's conscience. You also asked me about the, you know, the standing committees in, in parliament. Yes, I would say that a, a lot of work does get to be done on the parliamentary standing committees. Um, you know, these are not televised. Sometimes I feel that for the sake of transparency, uh, these deliberations ought to be televised. But then on balance, my, my view is that since there are no television cameras, there is no scope for grandstanding and therefore members of parliament actually sit down and get some work done. And uh, what we are, you know, discussing right now is confidential, but I can give you one example uh, where the standing committee was able to bring together uh, members from all political parties and, uh, you know, adopt a unanimous report. This happened to be on the constitutional amendment bill, uh, which cleared the way for the India-Bangladesh land boundary agreement. As you would know, there were many political parties that had been, you know, opposed to it before. But I actually played a very proactive role on this particular issue and suggested that there is a way uh, to balance the national interest. We need good relations with Bangladesh, the state's interest, uh, the states that border uh, Bangladesh and the human interest. Uh, the interest of these poor people who had been living in these enclaves uh, since uh, the 1947 uh, partition. Uh, 
And I have to say that not only were we able to reconcile our differences, we were able to adopt a unanimous report, and then uh, we even managed to pass this 100th constitutional amendment unanimously in both houses of parliament. But the basis for this was in fact laid in the all-party you know, standing committee on, uh, uh, on, on, on external uh, affairs. Uh, so uh, there are some things that can be done in parliament. And I have to say that over these four years, uh, my parliamentary colleagues have made sure that I'm less and less interrupted when I speak. So I have been able to speak in some of the major debates. There are some very sensitive issues that come up in question hour. I asked uh, uh, supplementary the other day when the Home Minister said that uh, all 40,000 Rohingya refugees should be candidates for deportation. And I pointed out that there was a contradiction between the position of the External Affairs Ministry, which is carrying out Operation Insaniyat in the refugee camps around Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. And there are 905,000 refugees there at the moment. And yet our Home Ministry seems to take a completely contradictory position. I have no objection to action being taken against a few who may have committed illegal acts, but I think it's entirely unfair to tar you know, all 40,000 refugees with the, with the same brush. But when I was saying that, uh, you know, and quoting the United Nations uh, um, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who visited the refugee camps uh, in July, you know, there were a couple of hundred ruling party members trying to shout me down, and I was the sole member trying to speak up for uh, the adoption of international norms in treating, you know, refugees and migrants and so forth. Um, but then the next day when I was asking a question about external affairs, I was allowed to put my questions to the external affairs minister, minister where I did not succeed was to get the Prime Minister to stand up and say a few words. It was a question about the informal summit in Wuhan, where he had a nine-hour conversation uh, with the Chinese president, but he let the external affairs minister, who was not there, speak for him. And despite our best efforts from the opposition, we were not able to get him to break his vow of silence. <laughs> On that note, uh, I am going to open it up to everyone to ask a question. Maybe we can uh, collect a few questions yes. and then yeah. to Richard. Yeah, um, thanks for this and uh, I really enjoyed this speech in the parliament as well. Do you want to come to the mic and ask your question uh, so that everyone can join? Yeah, so m my question really is so, um, when a clerk happened, when Kanaya Kumar happened, there was a certain outrage in India at that point which was, which was which is good because it was the first time round, and now it's the lynchings, um, people getting uh, booked for for anything that's anti-government has become the norm. I mean, yesterday or I don't know recently there was a car which was being beaten up by by these orange-clad guys in Delhi, and nobody did anything. And I saw them in Chanakipuri today. So, if there isn't the kind of cultural intimacy that is um, generated through civic society and if there isn't legal recourse, is are we at the brink of some sort of violence? Um, and is it possible, given there are obviously deep-rooted issues? And that's a valid question. Okay, should, should we, we yeah, let's collect it. <coughs> yeah. Um, where cultural intimacy is concerned, you know, I, I want to sort of uh, uh, say, can we sort of, you know, take the younger generation into this and, uh, you know, from sc school children to colleges also. Like, for instance, in the uh, NGO where I come from, you know, we, we celebrate all religious festivals, you know, all of them. So, you know, starting from celebrating religious festivals in schools and colleges, can we, you know, in a, in a sort of more positive way, uh, we are doing things. Can we do it at the school and college level first and foremost? And secondly, can a dialogue can a dialogue be initiated? You know, from time to time between uh, religious lead, Hindu religious leaders and also Muslim uh, religious leaders. Uh, 
because even the Muslim religious leaders, they also very, you know, they, they sort of come across, according to the media, as very bigoted and things. So can there be a dialogue, especially when these kind of issues come up and, you know, who would sort of, who could initiate that, you know, and so, I mean, can we work on these two things to improve the situation of cultural intimacy? Thank you. Maybe we'll take three and then take another set. This is in continuation of what she said. It is already happening in schools and colleges. But in the last four years, one has noticed that some get more attention and some get forgotten. The worry at the moment is that I worked in NCRT for years and worked on the national curriculum frameworks. One has often noticed, observed and gone through the process of changing the textbooks. And when the history textbooks are concerned, they are given more attention and that gets very difficult in a situation where the academia doesn't take a stand. That gets very difficult. The second is that it was still less difficult when the National Curriculum 2000 was being framed and the textual materials were being made. It has got much worse now. That is one thing. And the second is that when the independence of the institutions get compromised the way it is getting in the case of JNU, NCERT, NUPA, and many other universities, do you think that we would only be blaming the parliamentarians and not letting the blame come to us when we should also have taken a stand as academicians and not just watched silently? Most of us are always worried about the consequences. This is not the way the academicians should work for the next generation and get the history distorted. Thank you. I just want to add one more thing. And how could we mainstream Muslim children, you know, into, into the secular education, into the secular schools? I mean, we can't stop the madrasas, of course, but, you know, can we mainstream them more and more in, in the universities also and schools? Uh, to take the, the first question uh, first, uh, yes, uh, when our clerk happened in 2015 and when we eventually had a debate on intolerance uh, in early December of, of 2015, uh, I could sense that when I was speaking in Parliament, uh, I felt that there was some resonance uh, outside Parliament um, for, you know, what I was saying. And I could see that in the responses that I got, uh, even from uh, young people. Uh, you know, I'm not on social media, but uh, I've taught for more than three and a half decades, so vicariously I get on social media. Uh, and, and I receive, uh, you know, emails and other forms of communication. I could see that large numbers of people had been horrified by, you know, what had, what had happened. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, when there was this crisis in the universities, uh, the Rohit Vemula suicide in Hyderabad, and then uh, uh, the attack on the students of JNU in February of 2016, and uh, uh, they were being you know, beaten up even in the court premises of, uh, of, of Patiala House, and an entire university was being dubbed as a, you know, a center of anti-national activities. You know, again, when I got up to speak, and I was surprised that maybe 100,000 people had watched that speech on uh, uh, YouTube by the, the, that same sort of evening, I felt that, you know, there were people who were responding. Uh, I felt that I, I was not alone uh, in standing up against that phalanx of, uh, you know, BJP members of, uh, of, of parliament. Uh, 
that there was support outside. Um, these days, of course, as there are more and more episodes, say, of, even of lynching, there is a danger of this becoming normalized. And even horrific incidents might find their place in inside pages of the newspaper the next day uh, and not on the front pages. So that is the great danger. But on the other hand, I also feel that there had been a sense of fear, um, even in 2015, 2016, that this majoritarian government is all powerful. But now I think there are two things. One is that I still sense that despite this risk of normalization, that things are going so far that people who had bought into that development rhetoric are beginning to say that, look, you know, I, we are disgusted. Uh, we feel a sense of revulsion uh, when we hear of these, you know, awful uh, incidents. And also, I think if one looks at the media, there has been a slight diminishing of their fear, they were being completely cowed uh, by a majoritarian government until even about six to eight months ago. So that is what I would say the silver lining, the positive aspect, even though I recognize that what you're saying can be very dangerous. Of course, and yeah, the absolutely. Media is under attack. The, never yeah, no, no, they are, they are, they are, very, they, they are very much under uh, under attack. I'm not minimizing that, uh, but when the, the the ruling party seemed to be on a winning streak with, you know, no opposition, you know, after the results in the three by elections in UP uh, and so forth, there is a sense that they are not invincible, and that's what may have at least marginally lessened this, uh, you know, the sense of fear and insecurity that I used to see, particularly among journalists who, who I meet constantly in Parliament. Yes, I think that uh, even though I have suggested that there could be governmental or policy interventions that could be made in the pursuit of uh, cultural intimacy, much of the work has to be done uh, within educational institutions, in schools and colleges, it has to be uh, a, a civil society uh, uh, initiative. And again, you know, making children, you know, familiar with the multiple uh, religious uh, and linguistic traditions of our country is something that can be effectively, you know, done as, as part of our educational curriculum and also through extracurricular uh, activities. Um, and, um, you know, I am actually... You know, quite surprised. Uh, you know, be, uh, when I when I see this kind of separation uh, of of you know members of different religious communities, having grown up in Bengal, I have always found uh, my Muslim friends taking part in uh, you know religious festivals like Durga Puja, which is as much a cultural festival as a as a religious festival. I always went to. Uh, a, a Muslim classmate's home uh, 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 for Eid and so forth. Uh, you know, maybe Bengal is still a bit, uh, you know, different, but and and that gives us some hope uh, that this, uh, 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 you know, this formidable machine can be uh, can be stopped there. Even though there are threats in uh, Bengal as well, and I agree that uh, academicians must take a stand. You know, just as journalists are being attacked and many are fearful, uh, so also not just academic institutions, but even individual academics uh, are, uh, are being intimidated in sometimes subtle ways, in sometimes not so subtle ways. And yet I think this is a moment when one must resist. In terms of the actual curriculum, the distortions in history books, this was happening in certain states for quite some time, Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh and so on. But now there is a trend towards creating uniform curricula, you know, throughout the, the, the country. Uh, again, not reflecting the regional diversity of our land. Uh, but also, I think it's a bigger threat, which absolutely, you know, needs to be resisted. So what I would say is that 
this is indeed the time for active citizenship. Uh, there can be a few things that parliamentarians can do. There can be certain legal interventions, policy interventions, governmental sort of interventions, but not as long as this particular majoritarian government is in power in Delhi. Uh, but I think that every citizen really today needs to do a little bit more than simply going to vote on, on election day. So, yeah. Yeah. hands at, at the, the back. back. Yeah. Mukta and then, yeah, next to Mukta. So just carrying on uh, from the note at which you ended, uh, there's a cluster here at CPR that does work on down cities. And so my question was really, uh, there's something peculiar happening as a uh, you know, large percentage of our population is turning urban, either wh whether they move to cities or whether the places where they live are sort of transforming into more urban spaces. And we find that there's at one end a sort of um, obfuscation of identity but also at the at the same time a sort of self segregation to move towards people whom you perceive as sharing some sort of identity as you so uh, you know your comment on bengal sort of uh, provoked me to think about maybe there's something to do with the transitioning of our spaces and how we live and how we interact. Uh, that, you know, the older idea is that if you're living in a city and you're meeting people of all kinds every day, then there's sort of an everyday diversity experience that then should counter uh, sort of ideas of bigotry. But that's not what seems to be happening. These two, two experiences seem to be coexisting in a very strange way. And uh, then relating back to what you said earlier, then those of us who still want to move towards this sort of more inclusive idea find ourselves more and more isolated. So my question really is at what scale, if we were to assume that some sort of civic interventions uh, need to happen both from the ground up while we have some sort of legal top-down moves, at what scale do we make those interventions if we are thinking of big, more active forms of citizenship in, in this sort of changing context? Um, so, uh, so we under, so I understand the need for the civil society to be participative, but the fact that uh, there's a major threat to people's lives, even from the you know from from the civil society and especially academicians, you know, when they're caught in cartoon, you know, making cartoons and you know things like that. Um, how far do you think um, is the need to reform the bureaucracy? Because um, because. Where I get this idea from is from Antonio Gramsci's concept of cultural hegemony, where it's the bureau. If you need to change anything with regards to policy and things like that, you really need to target the uh, the embankments around the fort, which is the state. So, uh, therefore, signifying the need to attack the bureaucracy and change the bureaucracy in a sense, or completely demolish it. So, um, how far how far is there a need for the bureaucracy to change, and is is can it be can it be changed? Can there be measures to uh, that can be adopted to change them? So, I think just pulling together a lot of the threads of what you said and a lot of the 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 the, the interactions so far, it, we had a. We are at a particular moment where the idea of our nationhood is being challenged at the same time as we are going through a deep, complex form of social uh, change. And perhaps one leads to another. But I don't know that in certainly in contemporary times that India has faced this kind of unique historical moment where the political response to social churning is emerging in the form of challenging the whole idea of, of nationhood and, and, and seeking the idea of nationhood as a source of trying to address the, 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 the deep problems that the social churning itself is throwing up. In that context, and in a context of weak mediation institutions, the institutions of the state have weakened consistently over time. Civil society has always been relatively weak, you know, if, if you take out the organized civil society. Where is this mediation going to come from? And that mediation to me seems to be the most crucial issue in the context of your articulation of, uh, uh, you know, how we deal with the, the, the consequences of a particular secular impulse that was trying to project in 
the na nature of our society is very different to what it actually was. And so, so you're seeing these different conflicts. And I'm not clear where the, this mediation role is going to come from. What are your thoughts? Take one more and then okay. yeah, uh, I, I actually want to ask uh, what is the role of the government and the democratic setup of the parliament is to institutionalize the governance of public universities of the country. I am asking this because you talk about uh, resource devolution. In the course of uh, our uh, country, I have seen that uh, when government devalue resources to public universities, they also get a sense of ownership to the thing of the public universities. So, at the one point of time, uh, you are giving financial autonomy, administrative autonomy to universities, but at the same time, uh, you can't specify what that autonomy is. So, uh, the vice chancellor, for example, is on MHR research committee, putting somebody on the universities, an indirect way of channelizing the institutional governance of the universities in the form of giving financial autonomy or different sorts of things. So, in that case, the institutional structure and governance of public universities and the involvement of government in the public universities gets uh, a main thing when you talk about development of higher education system in our country, which I think most of the universities suffer these days a lot. So, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, what should be the role of the government in that sense and uh, how parliament can get involved in that sense? That be Thanks. Uh, first, the uh, the question of uh, rapid uh, urbanization in the last few decades, and um, in that context, you know, so, uh, George Simmel's idea of uh, uh, you know an urban identity that is diffused that has not actually come into being, and I see this on a daily basis uh, because I happen to represent a constituency, Jadavpur, which is a very fascinating one. Of the seven assembly segments, there are two that are fully urban, which lie within uh, the precincts of the uh, Kolkata Municipal Car Corporation, Jadavpur and Taliganj. And there are five segments that are uh, predominantly rural, even though there are urban nodes in the form of uh, Shonarpur and Baruipur. And what I find fascinating and sometimes a bit troubling as well is that, um, you know, attitudes, um, particularly among the urban middle class Hindus, let's be, you know, frank about it, in the urban centers can be much more narrow minded than what I see in the rural areas. In Baruipur, Shonarpur, Bhangor, you know, Hindus and Muslims are living together in peace, uh, you know, there is no segregation as such. I see them all together. Um, but in the urban areas in Kolkata, I find certain expressions of bigotry that uh, remind me of the few terrible months as a historian. I wasn't there. But from between uh, February of 1947 and August 1947, when a pulverized Hindu middle class of Kolkata um, basically followed the lead of the Hindu Mahasabha, talking at one level about Akhand Bharat, but actually demanding the partition of Bengal. And of course, uh, then there were uh, Hindu refugees from East Bengal who, who came in droves, and they never forgave either the Congress or the Hindu Mahasabha. For many decades, they uh, were attracted to sort of leftist parties. So in some ways, it, this is very counterintuitive, but that is the re social reality we are facing. Uh, in fact, in the rural areas, there is more cultural intimacy that still survives, and there is less and less in this sort of age of urbanization. I don't really know what I can say about uh, reforming the bureaucracy, but again, as a historian, I'll simply say that we seemed, uh, after 1947, to embrace the same, you know, bureaucracy, which had been castigated uh, during the uh, period of our anti-colonial uh, freedom uh, movement. And... Uh, 
and, and here too I have a disagreement with, uh, with, with Ram Guha, uh, where I say, yes, there may have been individual bureaucrats who were, uh, you know, very fine officers, such as, you know, the first uh, head of our election commission and so forth. But overall, I think that uh, the statism that I've talked about uh, had an institutional dimension as much as an ideological dimension. So it wasn't just secularism and socialism as ideologies of state, but there was the civilian bureaucracy inherited from colonial times, which continued for a, for a good while into the post-independence period. And now we have a strange scenario. Um, if you look at our, you know, Prime Minister today and also, you know, his time as Chief Minister of Gujarat, he actually likes to operate through chosen bureaucrats. I mean, that's not necessarily respecting the institution as a whole. Uh, he doesn't really like to face uh, Parliament uh, very much, uh, just as he didn't really want to call the Gujarat Assembly very much. But, you know, instead of thinking about institutional reform, you know, making a bureaucracy more responsive to social needs, what's happening is actually weakening of uh, institutions. Uh, and that doesn't bode well for our democracy because we need vibrant elective institutions, but also a healthy balance between the executive legislature and the judiciary. And also, ultimately, the bureaucracy ought to be responding to the political will, which you know, which ought to have some real social sanction. So there's no easy answer to your question about the bureaucracy. Again, Yamini, as usual, has asked a very difficult question of mediation and who will provide uh, uh, this kind of uh, mediation. I think part of the mediation will be provided uh, through the political process itself. Because I think... Um, you know, the religious majoritarianism that the ruling party represents is going to be challenged in many different ways. There will be regional parties talking about greater federalism, states' rights, uh, a greater voice in decision-making at the center for smaller states and so on. The sub challenge of the subordinated castes and classes will continue to be a formidable one. Um, and interesting, I mean, on the day of Karunanidhi's funeral, it's probably worth mentioning that it, that was a formation, I mean, whatever its problems later on, which originally represented both regional aspirations and the demands as well as the needs of the subordinated castes and, uh, and classes. And those same forces will, in fact, find expression even through a variety of political parties today maybe caste-based, maybe region-focused, but you will see that happening. But I do anticipate a little bit of a problem because uh, in the sense that, um, you know, when Trump emerged victorious and there was, uh, you know, uh, uh, a sense of uh, uh, complete sort of disillusionment among many in America, but there was an immediate counter you know, in terms of forces of mediation, there, were, there was a powerful women's movement which took to the streets in all of the major cities and towns of, uh, uh, of the United States of America. Uh, you know, in the United States, there's a similar problem of the Democratic Party, um, you know, having lost its way, just as our major opposition party, the Indian National Congress, continues to, you know, flounder in many ways. Uh, but, you know, the forces of mediation were, were much greater and, and there was a substantial fraction of the media, including the mainstream media, whether it's the New York Times or Washington Post or the MSNBC News Channel, which kept up a steady tirade against, you know, Trumpian majoritarianism, uh, you know. So, by comparison, the, uh, the forces of uh, mediation are weaker in India at the moment, that is a cause for worry, even though sometimes the challenges are much the same. Uh, I mean, for example, the current challenge is that, you know, the language of citizenship and illegal immigration will be used cynically to mask discrimination along lines of religion, language, 
ethnicity. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, when, you know, Trump did that in 2016, demonizing the Mexican immigrants, but there are those who are fighting back on behalf of these immigrants, on behalf of the dreamers, the, those who came as children, uh, but now no, no other country but America, and they've done quite well in the United States and so forth. We, uh, and yet the same thing happened. We have forgotten that in 2014, I remember, because I was campaigning at that time, and I heard Narendra Modi say in an election campaign speech in Bengal that on 16th May 2014, he will drive all illegal immigrants across the border to, uh, of Bangladesh. Uh, in fact, Trump repeated those kinds of statements two years later. Um, and yet, you know, the, the forces of mediation are not powerful enough in our country to take on that kind of a, of, of a challenge. Um, I hope that there will be some kind of coalescing uh, of resistance that will be articulated through the political process, by regional forces, by forces that uh, uh, represent the interests of subordinate castes and classes, but they will be able to form some kind of an alliance with these uh, civil society currents uh, to make the forces of mediation stronger than they currently are. Finally, the question about uh, uh, higher, higher education. Yes, um, you know, there is this great problem, of course, that whenever governments give money, they, you know, claim some kind of an uh, ownership, uh, and which I have resisted even in my own state. That you know, you, you, you are supposed to play an enabling but a non-interfering role in institutions of uh, higher education. But now the problem is slightly different. Frankly, I don't understand what this government means by this phrase, graded autonomy. I mean, it seems to degrade, you know, the very concept of, uh, you know, genuine and substantive Even autonomy. Even yeah. yeah. so, yeah. graded so, so, but there is a different kind of a, a problem now. Uh, in addition to the Higher Education Commission of India bill, you know, this government is in favor of this higher education uh, financing uh, agency. They want our public universities to take private loans uh, and uh, and so forth. So they are giving, you know, financial autonomy of a certain kind, which may not in fact be in the best interests of some of these academic institutions, but actually de denying them real autonomy when it comes to academic decision making, which is, you know, absolutely vital. And I would say that whatever the other weaknesses that we have, um, at least in the sphere of higher education, we have so many, you know, talented people in, in academia that at least in that arena, we ought to be able to resist and resist effectively. So I, we're almost out of time. So un, unless there are, well, I can see that there are many hands. So perhaps 30 seconds for the questions and Professor Bose can just take a few minutes to respond. Okay. How do you view the role of judiciary in uh, arresting uh, wrong tendencies, negative tendencies? Sir, so, I have apprehension with cultural intimacy. It should not be with the, uh, allow religion, the wrongdoing of religion to be tolerated or compromised. Like I have lived for some time in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. There, the Kashmiri Pandis, they were very intimate. And they have been massacred and thrown out. Where is the six who were living in silos? They have been spared. So that is just. A and now to the back, ma'am. Yeah. I was wondering, what is the impact of Mr. Modi's presidential form of governance on Parliament, where ministers are complete ciphers? How does it impact Parliament, particularly since you're dealing you're with the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs? We have a minister who's an agony aunt and nothing more, and uh, it is this very high-profile globetrotter. So, how does it affect Parliament, and particularly in foreign affairs? Thank you. 
first question was about the judiciary. Yeah. Uh, I think the judiciary, you know, has a role to play and in many ways has been playing a, you know, positive role, especially the, the, the Supreme Court of India, but not always. And we can't really rely on the judiciary all the time to resolve what are, you know, political uh, problems. Uh, so that would be my quick answer to, uh, you know, your, uh, to your question. I take your point um, uh, uh, that you're making, and I should clarify, and I should have done so in response to an earlier question, that I'm not a great champion of structured, you know, interfaith uh, dialogues, because I don't want to reify, uh, you know, uh, the different religious uh, communities. I, I want uh, uh, there to be a certain amount of fluidity, which is part of our, you know, religious uh, religious identities. And uh, I was, in some ways, uh, using the phrase cultural intimacy in a somewhat different sense from which you have, you know, uh, the, uh, and and that is, you know. Uh, you know, complete exclusivity, uh, I think, leads to a complete sort of lack of understanding and denies the possibility of conversations from taking place. Taking place. Now, what you are suggesting is a scenario where, you know, familiarity may have bred contempt and there may have been a real battle over political power and economic resources, which led to this kind of a uh, a problem in the uh, in, in, in the valley of, uh, uh, of Kashmir. Uh, these kinds of things happen at uh, moments of crisis. Um, for example, if you think about partition violence in 1947, you know, until 47, most of this kind of violence took place sporadically in urban centers, but the worst violence took place in rural Punjab. You, and uh, this has been described as... Uh, uh, by uh, Aisha Jalal as separating at close quarters and it was awful. Uh, so these kinds of things can happen at moments of uh, uh, real crisis but I think, you know, I have been advancing the notion of cultural intimacy in a very different sense uh, in order to go beyond just tolerance and toleration. I think our Indian nation would be much the poorer if we you know, just somehow put intolerance behind us and learn to be a little more tolerant of our fellow citizens. So there needs to be both intellectual engagement uh, as well as what I'm describing as a very healthy kind of, uh, of cultural intimacy. Uh, you're absolutely right. We have uh, now a, a cabinet where the prime minister is all powerful. I agree with your term that, you know, even cabinet ministers are ciphers. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, even when I actually posed a question in Parliament, which was addressed to the Prime Minister, uh, it was redirected to the External Affairs Minister. The question was about the informal summit in Wuhan, where the Prime Minister alone, had a nine-hour conversation with the Chinese president. And even though he was present in the house that day, uh, he let his external affairs minister answer the question, when in fact all the external affairs minister has left to do is to respond to calls of distress uh, from uh, our citizens in different parts of the world. And, you know, actual you know foreign policy is being conducted by our globe-trotting Prime Minister. Uh, so it is, a, it, it is a huge challenge. Um, you know, in the standing committees, we can get the Foreign Secretary to come and depose before us. Uh, but if so much of the actual decision-making is taking place at the, at the very top, it's hard to make, uh, you know, the government answerable uh, to Parliament. So we, we do have this major problem. I really do hope that in the future we will have a better outcome and so a Prime Minister will be in the future 
what he or she is meant to be, which is the first among equals, uh, and that we will really have, uh, you know, a cabinet form of executive government. Uh, so in many ways, I find that though there, there are those who are skeptical about multiple leaders of an opposition coalition and so forth, in fact, it might be healthier uh, if there was some degree of collective leadership and the prime minister turned out to be the first among equals. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I, I know there are more questions, but we are really out of time. But uh, so I'll just take this opportunity to thank you, Professor Bose, for a very, very stimulating and enriching uh, uh, conversation with us and uh, for stitching together these different uh, visions of nationhood and these uh, in the, the idea of unity and diversity, not uniformity, and for helping us uh, think about uh, power as decent, decentralized power and respect for the autonomy and dignity of the individual, even as we foster cult cultural intimacy between different communities and celebrate differences rather than obscuring them. Um, I, th I think because it has been such an engaging conversation, perhaps we can extract a promise from you of coming back and talking to us again when you're next in Delhi for the next session of Parliament. Uh, so on that note, thank you very much. Thank and you. It's been a real pleasure to be here at CPR. Thank you.